tolling bell in wrestling is an ill omen, for surely for all who hear it, death and destruction await. This grim herald signals the arrival of a creature of myth, legend, infamy, shuffling to the stage draped in black, creeping fog billowing behind and flanked by crackling bolts of lightning. Whoever is in the ring looks into the face of death himself. The Undertaker has been digging holes and claiming souls for 30 years now after debuting at Survivor Series in 1990. In that time, he's gone through many metamorphoses, from wrestler and mortician with first day at big school tie vibes, to resurrected revenant out for revenge, a dark preacher who swayed soothsayers, acolytes and bound blood-sucking vampires to his cause, bit of a wobble after that, get you some stabilizers on that bike taker, and then back to the big hat's dark coats and air of mystery as he became a living legend in the business. But what is it about this Dark Lord that has seen his influence spread throughout all of wrestling? How did the character endure an era in which gimmicks were dying out left, right and centre? And why is Mark Calloway's eye-rolling, bell-tolling, soul-owning alter ego one of wrestling's gods? I'm Laurie, hailing from Parts Fun Known, and this is The Undertaker Explained. Before we crack on with this episode though, please do consider giving us a subscribe so you never miss content like this, or you can support us on patreon.com forward slash parts fun known for awesome rewards and early access to all future videos. As befitting a creature that is risen from the grave, The Undertaker has gone through many reincarnations during his 30 years in WWE. After a two year stint at WCW where he went by the name Mean Mark Callis, he made his ominous debut at Survivor Series in 1990 as the final member of Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Team and made an instant impression with his pale face, methodical movement and towering size. Look at the size of it! The character was an idea that Vince McMahon had suggested, but they hadn't found the right person to portray it until they found Mark. And he was originally known as Kane the Undertaker, but in classic WWE fashion, that first name was dropped. Apparently they were saving it for somebody else. Mysteries. Decked out in a black Stetson with a grey band around it, leather gloves and spats, draped in a long black overcoat and his face a, a grim mask that concealed a barely restrained rage, he was a movie monster brought to life. A fact that Taker himself has recently talked about with Steve Austin on Broken Skull Sessions. As I thought more about the character and what I could do athletically, my presentation became, I want to lull people in. I want to stalk somebody when I get them her. I want people to feel like the boogeyman is going to come down the hallway and grab you, right? That's what I was trying to do, and honestly, I don't know why, but it clicked. Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees and Friday the 13th, I wanted to be like those guys. Those guys never moved fast at all. They always seemed to be in the right place when it was time to cut somebody's throat. The character lent itself to being the boogeyman. The boogeyman just shows up, so I would lull people into a false sense and all of a sudden, bang, quit something fast, boom, and then I'd throttle it back down. So the stalk and slay of Halloween and Friday the 13th is something that's inspired quite a few wrestling characters over the years. Bray Wyatt's Fiend has teethed a few tropes for his demonic passenger, which you can find out about in an episode of Explain that's up there right now. And also a fascination with the macabre was pretty popular in the US at the times as the Adams Family were rising to prominence again with Hollywood movies in 1991 and 93. So then when Brother Love handed Taker over to the care of new manager Paul Bearer, he kind of got his own Uncle Festus, Taker, I guess, being the lumbering lurch in this case. In Taker's case, the slower pace of a Jason, a Michael Myers, or even Lurch didn't exactly wow the crowds in the early part of his career, but it was his presence, his way of doing nothing, that made him a must-see 
wrestler. Because announced by a tolling bell and an organ playing the funeral march, one look at the sallow eyes peeking out from beneath the brim of his Stetson was enough to cast a chill over a crowd. And this unstoppable monster angle was something that management wanted to play up, so just a year after his debut, Taker beat Hulk Hogan for the WWF title at Survivor Series. With a little help from Ric Flair. Flair with a chair, a steel chair. But what I think was most fascinating about this first incarnation was that he was actually an Undertaker by trade. Listen to this. I'll embalm them. I'll sew their eyelids shut. I'll open their insides. And I'll steal the gold from their teeth. There is no peace in the Undertaker's mortuary. And then we're going to pick them up and we're going to put them in the carriage and then we're going to drive them to the chapel, get a little wreath that says the word Sally, hand a tissue to Grandma, stuff like that. So this era of Taker has come to be known as the Western Mortician because he's sort of an Old West Undertaker. Which is a role that rose to prominence in the 1800s as American towns in the West were being settled and the relatively new technology of preserving bodies so that loved ones could come and say their last goodbyes became commonplace. It was also a vital role as the average life expectancy was just 37 years of age. And as Roger McGrath, the author of Gunfighters, Highwaymen and Vigilantes said, it was a harsh environment with scorching deserts and dehydration. But perhaps the most lovely twist about this inspiration is that most wrestling gimmicks involved being a job and a wrestler. Mark Calloway was an undertaker and a wrestler. But Western morticians were often undertakers and furniture salesmen. Why? Well, because they were the ones with all the tools and the skills needed to make coffins, which is something that Taker would then bring into his gimmick. Rest. In peace. He would also revisit the Old West for inspiration later in his career, taking on the roles of the last outlaw and the gunslinger. Oh, I get it. You're the aging gunslinger with just a few bullets left in your gun, and you can shoot it out with anybody in the locker room. But Undertaker, you can't shoot with Brock Lesnar. From 2008 to WrestleMania 33 in 2017, Taker's character took on a Clint Eastwood glint, which kind of began as people started referring to him as the last outlaw as he went about putting old enemies like Triple H and Shawn Michaels to bed. But this then shifted into this roaming gunslinger character who would appear on the horizon as WrestleMania season rolled in, cloaked in a poncho, I imagine, like the man with no name from Sergio Leone's Dollars trilogy of spaghetti westerns. Or Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo, which inspired Leone becoming this Ronin, a kind of masterless samurai who doles out his own form of unorthodox justice, adhering to a mystifying moral code. I kind of prefer the Western comparison though, not only because Taker was the toughest guy in town, helping others to grow their legend through these intense standoffs, but he was also underneath all of the eyeliner and the pleather, sort of a slice of Americana. You just gotta look at the badass character, which was obviously an attempt to hew closer to the real Mr. Calloway, but kinda came out as this sort of semi-authentic American man from Texas that had been passed through a pop culture prism. But the gunslinger, now that's all about American myth making. Robert Thompson, the director of the Syracuse University's Blair Center for Television and Popular Culture, said that the Western has always been the American epic. It's exciting and violent and huge. We don't have a single text like the Iliad or the Odyssey, but the Western is our story. And maybe wrestling is that story too for Americans. It's exciting, it's violent, it's huge. Richard Aquila, the author of Wanted, Dead or Alive, the American West in popular culture said, the Western is flexible and that's why it's still alive. And he said the classic Westerns celebrated American exceptionalism. So the Undertaker story is a Western. Here's this mysterious old timer who just refuses to die and rides into town on his hog to put the upstart youth in their place before disappearing off into the desert again. And what could be more American exceptional than a six foot, 10 inch tall man who defies all of the pundits by putting on some of the best matches of his career at an age when others would be retired from the game. But then still doing matches, even when the returns were diminishing to say the least. 
you can't win all the comparisons. But the myth of the Old West isn't the only one that Taker drew on throughout his career. You all know that, I'm obviously going to talk about all the supernatural stuff. Because he died, didn't he? He died. All the way back at 1994's Royal Rumble, Yokozuna sealed him inside a casket and that was the end of The Undertaker. He disappeared from the WWF for seven months in reality to cover from a back injury, but in kayfabe to claw his way out of his own coffin. Bloody hands grasping for purchase in the mud of his graveside as he coughs up wads of dirt, desperately gulping in air, lungs heaving suddenly that the realization that you can't feel the cool rasp of the air on the back of your throat, you can't feel your lungs full to bursting, you can't feel anything. I've read too much into that. He, he, was, he was a dead man. The dead man taker swapped grey for purple on his gear, but that was really only the first step on a staircase that went straight down. Because soon it was out with the purple and in with the black and the buckles like he'd just discovered the music of him. 1996 marked the true turn to the dark side for Taker who donned druidic gear, employed malign magics and developed a true flair for the theatrical. Often shocking his opponents with supernatural trickery like summoning lightning or casting fireballs by pointing his finger. You know, magic. And this was when WWE really doubled down on the sort of pseudo-satanic religious imagery. It's all of the dark rituals and the pentagrams. It's crucifying Steve Austin, sacrifices, marriages, what looked like sacrifices. It's forming the Ministry of Darkness and proclaiming himself to be the Lord of Darkness. It is all pretty standard Bialza Bobbins, if you ask me, but it was a load of fun throughout the Attitude Era and had the true highs of a feud with a certain long-lost half-brother. We all know who it is. We set it up earlier in this video. Come on then, say it with me. One, two, three, Kanye. I've, I've read that right. It's Kane. Kane. That's gotta be Kane! And obviously this feud was dripping in religious significance and foreshadowing too, as a certain other Kane had had jealousy issues when it came to his brother, and we all know how that went. Personally, though I do love this stuff and 10 year old me absolutely lapped it up, it wears its influences so plainly that you don't massively need me to explain anything about it. What I think is much more interesting though is when these magical and mystical parts of the character meet the dead man character with this kind of old west swagger and a splash of the badass sprinkled in there too so that we can get to know the man beneath the hat. And Take has kind of been this version of the character since 2004, flitting in and out, cherry picking the best bits of everything that came before to become one amalgamation of Undertaker. He became the embodiment of the myth of the Undertaker. A kind of wrestling god who can inhabit different aspects, much like the Morrigan of Irish mythology who is either a phantom queen or a trio of sisters depending on who you ask. The unholy trilogy he brought up in the feud with AJ Styles ahead of the Boneyard match makes this triple deity kind of thing explicit. A character who, like in myths, works in cycles. Is it Zeus or Jupiter who's the king of your pantheon? Is it Cain or Randy Orton lighting the casket on fire this time? I mean, Taker even turns up once a freaking year for wrestling Christmas. Couldn't be more religious. French literary theorist Roland Barthes in his essay The World of Wrestling said that American wrestling represents a sort of mythological fight between good and evil. Barthes studied semiotics, or the interpretation of signs, kind of anything that communicates a meaning, and he said that the objects that are these signs become myths. For wrestling, he said, each sign in wrestling is endowed with an absolute clarity, since one must always understand everything on the spot. As soon as the adversaries are in the ring, the public is overwhelmed with the obviousness of the roles. It's signs like Ric Flair's lavish but effeminate robes, suggesting that he's rich, probably stuck up, and sadly in the case of effeminate items in wrestling, probably also the bad guy. Or kind of the way The Undertaker looms and leers from beneath the rim of a black hat, which tells you he's dangerous, mysterious, and connected to some dark power. Bart even compared wrestlers to gods, saying, when the hero or villain of the drama, the man who was seen a few minutes earlier possessed by moral rage, magnified into a sort of metaphysical sign, leaves the wrestling hall, impassive, anonymous, 
carrying a small suitcase and arm in arm with his wife, no one can doubt that wrestling holds that power of transmutation which is common to the spectacle and to religious worship. In the ring, and even in the depths of their ignominy, wrestlers remain gods because they are, for a few moments, the key which opens nature. The pure gesture which separates good from evil unveils a form of justice which is at last intelligible. And sure, there's a bit more of a grey area around The Undertaker, who now seems neither good nor evil, and is instead this kind of force of nature inflicting his own form of justice on the WWE roster. The Undertaker works in mysterious ways. And perhaps even more than Bart expected a performer to, Taker throughout his career has embodied that wrestling god. Because until recently, there was no him carrying a small suitcase arm in arm with his wife. He slept in a grave as far as we all knew, because he lived and breathed the gimmick. Like he told Stone Cold, I lived it because I knew I couldn't be different than what they saw on TV. I never stopped working. I never tried to put myself in situations where I had to be anything other than what people saw on TV. They got a slight variation because I was in street clothes, but they never got much more than that. I think it worked. I mean, it more than bloody worked. For years, The Undertaker was a creation that belonged purely to wrestling, this kind of perfect bundle of signs, a phenom, a legend, something we could understand but never fully comprehend. And it's not just about not knowing that he really likes tigers. It's not knowing anything that could have made him human, something mundane that would have taken the shine off this wrestling god. Bart said, the function of a wrestler is not to win. It is to go exactly through the motions which are expected of him. And I kind of doubt that there are many people in the history of wrestling who he expected more from and who rose from the grave time and time again to meet them. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up or share it around on social media and Reddit as that would really help us out. And also leave a comment down below letting us know your favorite Undertaker moment of all time and let us keep this conversation going. And like I said earlier, please subscribe to Parts Fun Known for more in-depth wrestling videos. But the very best way to support us is on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Parts Fun And at all the different tiers, you get ace rewards like early access to our videos, a fan quizzlemania, and you can even have your name read out by one of us like these lovely $25 backers. Terry Hankamer, Daniel Bridger, Daniel the Mayor of Painesville Schachtmeier, Dan Coral, Tim Dakuma, Matty J, Matt Jadoween, Julio Treo, Vincent Garcia, Christian Womble, Brandon Sires, Joe Meyer, Arbor Safriri, John Scheindelman, Soren Nord, Max Wallen, Glenn Dallas, Matthew Hernande, Stephen Mazzafaro, Lynn Bell, and Kyle Brazel. And if I've butchered your name, I am so, so sorry. So like I said, thank you for watching. If you're new to Explain, why not consider watching one of our earlier videos in the series, like the one about the fiends ties to horror films that I mentioned earlier in this video, or the last video that I did, which was on blading in wrestling. Until next time, jam that jam.